So today we are talking all about preparing for my first interview, um, including my teacher portfolio, what I'm doing to prepare um, for it. And just so you guys know, I am going to make timestamps below. So if you just want to see what's in my teacher portfolio and not kind of how I got here, just look at the timestamps and go to that time. But for you guys that would like to know and have followed me and are kind of like, whoa, what happened since last time I saw you, um, you can stay tuned. <laughs> So I know it's been probably like just over a week since I've made a video and kind of talked to you guys and a lot has happened in this week, a lot. And one, I had my birthday, so that kind of like added it to the mix. But second, um, postings got listed February 27th for my district. And that is one of the earliest I've ever heard of job postings get listed. Luckily, my principal kind of hinted at it that like, get ready, like make sure your resume and you have your like letters of recommendation ready to go by the 27th. And I was like, okay. And so luckily I had a little bit of um, heads up about it. Um, so <laughs> it got posted February 27th, which I believe was a Monday or Tuesday. And so I applied for a few. I applied for some at my school that I'm at student teaching at now. And I also applied for one or two of different schools just because I don't want to put like all of my eggs in one basket. You know, I don't want to like be like, oh yeah, I for surely I'm going to get a job at the school I'm student teaching at. And when I end up not, not having another backup plan. Um, so I did go ahead and apply for four different positions. Um, one, at my school now, and then some other ones in around the school that I'm working at, but same district. And I was kind of talking to some people like, hey, like when do we think interviews are going to come up? Um, like when should I kind of like have the idea? And everyone was like, oh yeah, after spring break for sure because um, we have conferences and they're like, that'd be a lot for someone to have to go through conferences and do interviews and so I was like okay during spring break I will get everything ready to go um I will practice I'll prepare I'll get this and like I'll spend the whole week just designating for my interview and then so that was about like I want to say Tuesday or Wednesday and then Friday comes and I had my observation meeting with my vice principal who came and observed one of my lessons it went extremely well. It was like the best birthday present I could ever ask for. Um, like we had the best conversations and she was just so excited to hear about the research I was doing. I was really excited to get to talk to her and kind of get like some more information about the school and like what she thinks is going to be available. And um, it was just a really, really good conversation. And then about 40 minutes after that conversation, uh, the principal calls me down and just tells me like, hey, I see you applied for this grade position. Just so you know, this grade's interviewing on Monday. Um, I'm gonna give you the 11 o'clock time slot because she knows I'm there all day. And I was like, okay, thanks. <laughs> and I walk out, I'm like, oh, I have an interview on Monday. It was Friday that I found out. Like this Friday I found out I had an interview on Monday. So freaking out. Um, like super excited, like I'm all like very excited for this opportunity and everything, but I would lie if I say I was not freaking out about this because I am definitely freaking out. And I knew I had so much to do to prepare for this interview and I had pretty much, I have two days to do it. I'm still preparing, like I'm still actively doing it now. I just wanted to take a break to show you guys what I'm doing and how fast I have to do it. Um, so, that's kind of where we're at now. And tomorrow's Monday. So tomorrow I have my first interview, probably my most important interview, because this is the place and the grade I want the most. And yeah, so here we are. <laughs> um, I do want to make one disclaimer though, because as I'm like telling people and friends that I have an interview on Monday, I keep getting this comment of oh well there's a teacher shortage so you should definitely get the job like don't even worry about it you don't really even have to try um if you show up you'll get the job and I'm like that's not true um just because there's a teacher shortage doesn't mean that there's not competitions for certain positions and certain jobs um I don't really know how many people applied for this position I have no idea 
but all I do know is that it is a grade that is a lot of teachers want um, and my school is great. I love my school. I love the principal. I love the community. I love the colleagues. I just love everything about the school. So I can imagine if other people know about how good this school is that they would also want to apply for this job. And so I think the notion of, oh, there's a teacher shortage, you'll get the job really like I just have a hard time with it because it's like if I don't get this job I'm going to feel terrible and terrible telling my friends like yeah there's a teacher shortage and I still didn't get this job um and so I think if you are going through this and you have people telling you this just know that the competition's still there the interviewing process is still the same as it was before teacher shortage you still have to stand in front of a huge panel of people and they're all eyes are on you and you have to answer questions like a scenario based questions and that alone is a ton of pressure so saying oh you don't have to prepare you can just show up that's not true you still need to prepare you still need to act like there's a hundred applicants for this job and give it your all and then if you don't get the job at least you know you gave it your all and that there's competitions and i think if you're willing to teach at any school any grade you don't care about the pay you don't care about your colleagues or anything like that then you might not have as much competition because you're like oh i'll just go to this school and this school and i'll have 27 interviews and then see if i get a job so just know that what you're doing is still very important it is still challenging and you are still putting in the effort where it needs to be because people are making me like making me feel like I don't need to put in this effort and that as long as I'm breathing someone really told me that as long as I'm breathing I'll get the job I'm like that is not true that is not true at all um so that is my one disclaimer for the interviewing process and the 2023 realm um this is for fall of 2023 so like full classroom this is not for the end of the semester so again this is very 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 early and why i wanted to get this video out to you guys so as you guys are coming up on them i don't know if your districts are as soon as mine probably not but they're coming up and so i wanted to help you guys out so let's get into the teacher portfolio if you guys have not heard it's all over TikTok, youtube google everywhere about bringing teacher portfolios into your interviews now the reason why I decided to do one because there is some controversy like you spend all this time and they may not even look at it the reason why I am bringing it is solely just for visuals and examples that I can pull from from this and also help to get eyes off me and onto my paper being severely dyslexic sometimes like thoughts in my brains like get jumbled and I get like really sporadic and start stuttering and stuff and so this will really help me like organize my thoughts and also give me a chance to like recuperate and make sure that I'm answering the questions properly with the examples and have the data in my hands to prove that. And so I got a template off of Teacher Pay Teachers. It was about $8 for like after taxes and everything. So I know with my Meet the Student Teacher, some people ask me for the template. I can't give it because it's a licensed template. And since I paid for it, like the teacher gets money for it. So you guys would have to go purchase it purchase it yourself um, but if you don't want the exact template you can definitely like copy the sections and just do your own for sure um, but it is one I bought so this first part just says Kaylee Reynolds teaching portfolio elementary educator yeah that's my full name whatever y'all could stalk me and figure that out um, so the first thing that I have and this is gonna get like really interesting of trying to cover up my purse like personal information because there's a lot of it on here um so this section i have five resumes because your panel is so large you don't know how many copies you're going to need of things so i rather have more you know and then only have to give one out but i do know that some interviews have you have people from your county there your principal will definitely be there vice principal plc the team that you will be hiring onto is usually there. So there is about nine to 12 eyes on you. Um, and so I have a ton of copies for anyone that wants one and they're here, they're stapled together, ready to go. Um, my resume, I am very proud of this resume. I love it. I love the template I made of it. And yeah, so luckily that was all ready to go. And then the second section I have is kind of 
I'm gonna cover up uh, some just my teaching philosophy to kind of come up with my little snippet. It's not my teaching philosophy, but it's close. So it just says a passionate educator who fosters a safe environment for learning and success for all students by using differentiated teaching strategies and a variety of learning methods. Um, and then I just kind of have bullet points of like important things that I think that is willing to know um, right there. So it just says masters of elementary education. And I put May of 2023 because I don't have a master's yet, but I will for the year that I'm getting interviewed for. Um, and then certified in trauma enforced practices. I did that through my school, which I love them. Uh, three years of teaching experience and then I explained three semesters of student teaching and three years of teaching online. Um, I teach at out school. It's an online teaching place. It's great. I love it. Um, and I've been teaching there since the pandemic. So it's been giving me really helpful of how to teach, talk with parents and especially an online version. And then I just say focus on building classroom community, differentiated instruction and seeking to grow as an educator through prep professional development and collaborating with colleagues. I think that's a very important bullet point that one, you're looking to enhance your education even more, especially being a student teacher. I know that I don't know everything and I need to grow and using that professional development and talking with my team is going to get me there. And then I just attached some pictures I keep covering it up one because one has my last student teaching class where we did the fun run and I came up with all the costumes. Um, and then I just posted how all the kids wrote me like goodbye letters and then just the I ready math heart, which I've shown in previous videos that I did. And then just my information at the bottom. And then the next thing is the table of contents. So this is just flip to what page to find this. So I have two, three, four, five main sections. So my first one is teaching philosophy. And in that I have curriculum assessment and how I differentiate classroom management and communication. Those are all with teaching philosophy. Then I have teaching plan examples and we'll get to what I have there. A look into my classrooms, which is pictures I've taken, classroom data, and then references. So those are kind of the main five topics that I have. Now my teaching philosophy, I'm very, very proud of this page. I worked, I mean, I worked really hard on this whole thing, but this one especially I'm really proud of. Just so you guys know, this entire portfolio took me about, oh, I think I just showed something, about six hours to do. So I spent the entire day yesterday making this. So when I say start early, start early because, well, it's your whole weekend, you're gonna be scrambling and feeling rushed like I did which I didn't really have a choice, but kind of, I don't really know. Okay, my teaching philosophy is, my core educational philosophy is grounded in the belief that every child has the potential for achievement and the capacity to learn. I think that the key, the key is to guaranteeing academic growth for all children is differentiated education and teaching to a variety of learning styles. So that is my teaching philosophy itself. Now, writing that out, Coming up with it, typing it out has already helped me memorize this because they're going to ask you your teaching philosophy. That is probably one of the top questions that they're going to ask. So just being able to type it out and like keep reading through this. Now, if you were to ask me as an interviewee, what's my teaching philosophy? Am I going to say it word for word correct? No. But am I going to get really close? Yeah. And I know that it's a very strong teaching philosophy and that if I can hit those key points, like differentiated education, learning styles, that the kids have potential for achievement, like no matter the kid, if I hit those points, I got my teaching philosophy down, which is awesome. Um, the next is curriculum and instruction. So I just said, develop and carry out units based on long-term objectives using backwards planning. If you are in education, like, in college right now, you know that backwards planning is very important and is kind of a newer thing. Um, so knowing your why you're teaching, knowing your goal and kind of working backwards from that. And then I'm a very data-driven um, person. So I also explained that. Assessments, you wanna include informal and formal or formative and summative assessments. So how you will do it. So informal, I said, 
um, informal post lessons checks and classroom observation notes. So basically observing what are kids knowing, what are they not knowing just by what I see in the classroom. And then formal assessment, interim evaluation, fixed assessments, grading students against a precise grade level criteria and learning objectives. So I actually helped when I was writing this, I used their curriculum and looked at what their definition was for formal assessments. And it helped me create my own definition for formal assessments. So saying precise grade level criteria, um, I think it says something of like, needs to be at grade level and I just like reworded it so it's my own word, so it's not plagiarism and made it. And that's how I got my definition for formal assessments. Different, this word is so hard for me to say and I don't know why and it's like one of the most important words. So I know if anywhere I'm gonna mess up during this interview, it's differentiation. I don't know why it's so hard for me to say, but basically I just talked about small group, individual differentiate, and then lesson delivery. So small group, um, my school is very, very keen on grouping your small group by their skills, not by their levels. So let's say like reading, for example, it's not like level K is gonna meet with me. It is who can understand or who can't understand main idea. If you can't understand main idea, you're coming with me. So based on the skills. And then like individual ones, obviously conference time for all of them. Lesson delivery, making sure that all learners can access the learning styles um, and like the information. And then classroom management is my next one, which I'm also super proud of. It looks like this. So on the top, it just says preventative, preventative and then reflection and differentiation of, again, or reinforce, reinforcement is in the middle one. So prevention, creating classroom rules together with students and clearly explain duties and responsibilities. So having the class help me with what they think is important and what does it mean to be a safe classroom. Co-create class transition procedures with students input Teachers and students model expectations constantly. That's really important that not only are you modeling it, but your students are modeling it too. And be like, look at how so-and-so is doing this. This is what I want everyone to look like. Um, create a strong classroom community, which favors collaboration. So the classroom bond is how I prevent behavior management. And then foster and model social emotional strategies. Um, our school doesn't have a designated social emotional learning time where some of the other schools I've worked at did. And so I think this would be an important time to how to add social emotional strategies is kind of those like mornings or whenever we have, you know, a flare up in our class or some, you know, big events in our class that we kind of just all need to take a break and like regroup and kind of learn about those social emotional strategies. Um, so reinforcements, individuals, so positive feedback based on students' use of the expectations. And I say the use of class money or dojo points. When you're ever talking about reinforcements, I always state the positives. How am I reinforcing in a positive way? So giving class money or dojo points, depending on what grade I'm teaching. If I'm teaching an older grade, obviously dojo points aren't gonna do much, but if I'm teaching a younger grade, they love to hear the like little dojo point, like ding. Um, but I do love classroom money. So paying them when they're doing something good or and then giving them paychecks for their class duties, it's great. And then I said beyond the classroom, so like outside of the classroom. So share and celebrate positive feedback with parents and the school. So I really hound on the fact that my communication with parents is not all negative. Um, I rather have it all positive than negative. And I don't want to start off with negative and then be like, oh, several weeks, several weeks, this kid was bad, 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 bad. Oh, and then by the way, here's a positive email. I want to start with the positives, build that relationship with the parents, say, hey, you know, my friend today has been great. He's been so on task. He's been working hard. I just want to let you know. And then in two months, be like, hey, like I, something's off. You know, I had this conversation with him, blah, blah, blah. So that way, like you already have that positive relationship with parents before it's negative, 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 negative. And start it off positive. Don't start it off with a negative phone call home. Start it off positive. So I really am passionate about that. And I have that throughout a lot of my portfolio. Um, and then the different, see, I told you this word, differentiation is where I talk about 
more of the negative behaviors. So I said some students may require individual supports or behavior plans to meet expectation based on the needs of the child. So may need individual plans. Hey, your goal today is to sit in your chair during lessons. That's an individual plan, right? I don't have to tell every kid to do that. Well, my class, I probably have to, but <laughs> most of the time I don't have to tell every kid to do that. Um, and so that's kind of like an individual plan. Like, hey, let's talk it out. Let's make a new plan today. Another one, if it's like a true individualized plan, like with specialists, I say create a behavior plan based on students' interests and needs and the collaboration with the specialist and family. Again, I'm incorporating the parents in this conversation. And then monitor certain data points, update your family members on their progress and celebrate in the success or meet again to tweak your plan. So if it's not working, we meet again with all three of us and we come up with a new plan. And again, celebrating that success. Um, I forgot to been showing like, hold on, let me just take out my resume so I can't stop having to like blur it out. Um, I forgot to show you guys, like, this is kind of like what it's laid out like. So you have the title here and then like what it's talking about. Um, probably at the end, I'll just do like a little clip of like it all. So you guys can see it clearly. Cause I know me sitting here and like showing it, it's not the best, but, um, I am still really proud of it. So now we are on classroom communications. Again, me communicating with parents is a huge part of the kind of teacher that I am. And so I just said I use class tag as a way um, to communicate with the parents. I showed example of me posting updates and then example of events. Now, obviously I do not have my own classroom. So I use the demo version for um, class tag and just demoed fake weekly updates and fake events so they could see in real life this is what it would look like. But obviously I didn't have a class. And so I just had pictures of both of those and what it would look like through the website. Um, I could do a whole nother video of like class tag and go into that. Um, but yeah, so student progress updates. I talk about how in class tag they can access Google Classroom. So all of my online assignments are always posted through Google Classroom so they can access their kids Google Classroom and see the grades and the feedback I give to them constantly throughout the whole year. And then also um, my school that I'm interviewing for does Thursday folder. So any paperwork or like hands-on assignments will be taken home on Thursday folders where they can see the grades and the notes I give them for that. Okay, another classroom communication is the like weekly what we're doing. All of my subjects and everything are all color coded and they're all, you will see. So red, like reading will always be the like pastel red through everything, even my own lessons. I color code lessons that way. And it's always rainbow, just because rainbow is an like easy pattern for me to remember. Um, and it looks cute, so it works. Um, so I just have like a quick gist of here, here's what your kids are doing this week. You know, we're doing lesson seven, which is and for the theme of a folk tale. I love sending parents this because they can sh like show them how much time they actually have for like writing assignments, especially. Like my kids have five days to write one paragraph, edit, revise it. So there should be no reason why any of my kids should not have a paper produced. If a mom's like, or dad's like, wait, well, hey, like my kid didn't have enough time. I'd be like, you see our plan. This is the plan we follow. They had five days to do it and they just chose not to, you know? So it gives you also like a little bit support when it comes to that. And then I go into like my personal weekly plans. So how this is like what the parents see, this is what my weekly plans look like. So a lot more details, a lot more intense, a lot more links. Um, Oh yeah, I also have assessments on here too, so parents can pre-see like when assessments are. Um, so mine is just exactly what we're doing, what chapter we're on, what is the chapter about, and all the links I need for that chapter for everything. Um, also my small groups, what am I doing in those small groups? What's the enrichment doing? What is the spiral groups doing? Um, yeah, for every single lesson. So this took me, a chunk of time to come up with because 
my mentor teacher has had this all done for me for the rest of the year. So I haven't had to personally do this. And so, which is great, but then also I was like, I have no proof that I can do this. So I just did what I know that we're doing in my class and just came up with the template. So this is what took me the most time. So if you already have this, like examples of it, great. It won't take you the full six hours. Um, and then I also just did one unit um, for my unit plan. Some people do whole years. Again, I don't have a whole year outline. Whenever, if I interview again after I've been a teacher, obviously I'll have a whole year outline. But for me, the amount of time it would take me to mock up a year outline is not worth the outcome, I think, of what it would be, especially if they don't look at it. That would take me alone probably four or five hours to come up with a whole year units. Um, and to me, that was not useful for my time for this interview process. So I just did one unit. I did unit nine, which is from spring break to end of the year and showed again, color coding the same colors for the same subjects. So it's consecutive through all of my lesson plans. Once again, small group plans, you see the color coding and this is based on, again, I reiterated the fact that it, each group is chosen based on skill that they were will require that week or skill they needed to be familiar with in advance to this academic understanding. So let's say we're working on division. Well, you can't divide if you don't know how to multiply and you can't divide if you don't know how to subtract. So I'm going to have to spiral back all the way to subtraction just so my kid can do division. Does that make sense? Um, and so... I just have the skills that they would be working on. This is only one week for reading, writing, and math. So I just have like, let's just go over Mondays. So Mondays for reading, understanding main idea, writing, pull out text evidence. So highlighting, being able to pull out what's important from a text. Math, survival math facts, addition and subtraction. So any kid that I am doing informal assessments on, so basically viewing and seeing this kid does not understand subtraction, I will pull to that group. So it's a very flexible and fluid group. So it's not the same people every time and it's not the same skill I'm teaching every time. So that is very different than a lot of small groups. I know in a lot of like, it's a lot different than how a lot of schools do it, but that's how my school does it. And I personally agree with it. Um, and then I have just one lesson plan, like a true college, seven page lesson plan. Um, this is just one of my favorite ones that I created myself and I have um, just stapled all of like the lesson plan and then like the stuff that I would need for the lesson plan. So this is a social studies one. So like pictures I would show the kids, their worksheets, stuff like that. Um, this would be a great time to also include like true students work for this. Um, I happen to not have any for this lesson. That is the one thing I'll kind of go back to what I wish I did, but that is the one thing I wish I did more was collect students work from lessons I created. Um, this is not necessary, but I thought this was kind of cool, especially since if you are like in the younger grades, um, a visual daily plan for kids that need the visual daily plan. So I created like, so they can check it off as they go each day and it's with real pictures. So Reading, we use benchmarks such as the actual benchmark logo and not just like a little cartoon. Um, next, oh, we have inside my classroom. This one, I cannot show half the page because it's actual students in our parties. So let me see if I can cover it up. Um, but I did have one like my work thing I did and then a student's work thing. And it was when um, we connected to read aloud books by using visuals. So instead of making kids write down the main idea or summary, they were able to like draw a picture or we use magazines in this case of how did you connect with this book? And I connected with me and my grandpa, which you see a picture of us. And then another kid connected with like be authentically yourself and they cut it out with magazines, which I thought was really cool to show. Um, another one, my capstone is on motivation in the classroom. And so I really pinpoint, pinpointed this. This is also a gateway to get into my research to show like, hey, like this is how I keep engagement. Also, did you know I have a whole research on this and this is what I found. 
Um, so showing my iReady math and how they've been coloring it in and doing great. The snowball game, keeping motivated in that way. And then data assessments. So I, this is the only thing where like I, well, not really. Um, that like I came up with my own data chart and collected data on was our math small groups. I'm actually very proud of this data. This is one that I'm actively still doing, um, but it's very important that you black out the names for the students, even if it's your own school, um, just to show that you do respect that confidentiality, confidentiality of it, um, but it shows the growth. So it shows where the kids started before I like, had math intervention with them six weeks after I have one kid that grew 36 points in six weeks from their first quiz to their second um and so that's crazy and I really want to show this off to show look like how I'm teaching and doing small group intervention is working and it's working for these kids and it would work if I had my own classroom too and then after I just have my references or letters of recommendation I have three um it says anywhere from three to five and so I have two for my mentor teachers so one for my current one and one for my formal former mentor teacher and then I have one from um I used to like babysit her kids and she's a professor for Arizona State University she does like the online ones and she's kind of like just watched me grow you know and has helped me like with the academic part of it and just being a professor you know giving like her professor and friend advice and so she's really helped me and kind of seen me go from like not being a teacher to a teacher so she wrote a really awesome letter of recommendation for me um and so did my mentor teacher and then I also have um how many did I put in here I have three from students at my last placement as a go away gift they all wrote me letters of recommendation um and they are literally the cutest letters of recommendation you'll ever read I almost cried when I started going back and reading these um and they are so sweet and I think it really showcases that not only can you teach kids, but kids also enjoy you being their teacher. And so that was a very long talk and conversation, um, but it's very important and I think this could be very useful information if you are going into an interview for being a teacher. But I'm going to now go over some things I wish I would have done differently as I was filling out this teacher portfolio. I was like, dang, I wish I did this before I got to this point. And the first one is being take more pictures. The example that I was kind of like the template I got, she had so many pictures and I, I mean, I have some and they're good pictures. But I know I did a lot more and I know I could have showed a lot more if I took pictures throughout the whole process. So if you're just now going into like elementary of education, um, like program, start taking pictures now. Even if you think, oh, well, I'm not going to be interviewing for four years. It doesn't like that is so many more pictures that you can like choose and pick from instead of like having to go and find them. Um, so I wish I took more pictures from like my first student teaching. I didn't take any because I was such a new teacher. I was like, I don't really know what I'm doing. Like, I don't know. I just didn't have the confidence in myself and like even confidence to ask if I could take pictures. So that is number one of things I would change. Take more pictures. Number two, start this a lot earlier than a weekend before you know you have to interview. Again, um, this is like the one of the earliest I've ever heard and so it's I was planning on doing it like I was planning on doing it early um I just think that the timing just caught me off guard and so it I literally spent a whole weekend doing it um yeah so those are like the two big things that I wish have your letters of recommendation together get them now because I had two and I had to like message my um one of my letter recommendation like hey I'm so sorry I know it's the weekend I know this is a rush but can you please like do this um because like none of my advisors or professors currently would do it because they don't answer emails on the weekend so I was kind of really scrounging and kind of stressed about getting the third one um like I know like people like I would have so many 
if I could do it like in a week or even have like weekdays to do it. Um, but I only have the weekend and I know a lot of people don't look at their emails for weekends. So that is my other piece of advice. <laughs> but some other things that I am doing besides my teacher portfolio to prepare is obviously one, have your outfit ready to go. I am dressing, um, I'll show you guys. I'm gonna do like a vlog tomorrow, but I am dressing very professional. I'm wearing my green slacks I have with a different black shirt and like white shoes and wearing my hair up just to show that like I really care about this position and I take it very seriously and yeah um so I'm dress dressing very professionally um which I think you should all do even if like no elementary education like you can wear like fun graphic shirts and like show a lot of colors and stuff um but I think that there's a time and place for that and this is not it you can show your true self you should definitely show your true self during an interview but also show that you respect their authority and that you are willing to kind of almost go out of your comfort zone um to dress very professionally for this job um another thing that I'm doing is googling potential teacher questions. There is hundreds of them, hundreds of them. And you do not want to get a question that one you've never heard of and have no answer for. One of the questions that I keep getting brought up and I was like, if I didn't pre-read this, I probably would have froze. And it is, um, tell me about a time where you and a coworker had a disagreement and how did you go about resolving, resolving that? Um, that's a, that's a big question, you know, or if you were to get into a conflict with a coworker, how would you go about? And I think I would be able to answer it, but I don't think it would be exactly what they wanted to hear. But now that I know it and I've seen other people answer it, I know what I would say. So know your teaching philosophy, look in the mirror, say it, say it to yourself over and over again, say it in the shower, say it in while you're driving. I'm just doing it constantly because I have two days to get it all in my head and filed um, that I'm literally, that's all I'm doing. It's just, okay, what is your teaching philosophy? Well, uh, it's grounded on the belief, you know, just keep going and just like keep coming up with questions in your own head and saying it. If you have someone else in the house, have them interview you. Take the 200 list and say, pick seven questions and ask me. Great idea. I happen not to have anyone this weekend, of course. Um, so I'm just kind of doing it myself, which is fine. We're all good. We're gonna do great. <laughs> But I know this is a very long video. This is actually my longest video I've made, but it is one of the most important I feel like I'm going to make. Um, and this is a huge, huge, huge step in not only my career, but your career too. If you are going in this field, this is a huge opportunity and honestly a life-changing interview. Yes or no, it is life-changing. Are you gonna be with this school? Are you not? Are you with this grade? Are you not? And if you're not, it's okay, we'll pick us up again and go try for another school. Um, but I think it's very important that we spend the time on this and you are doing your part by looking at videos and seeing what you can do. So I'm gonna go ahead and show you guys like close-ups of my teacher portfolio. But thank you so much for spending some time with me watching. Hopefully you guys found this helpful. Please ask me if you have any questions and I will be vlogging all day tomorrow. So my interview is at 11, so during specials tomorrow. So say a prayer, think happy thoughts for me, and I'll let you know. So, all right.